Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to the open house for the 2023 annual service plan. I'll be going over some slides just to um, kind of detail what we're going to be doing or what we're proposing for 2023, and then getting into a little bit of what's being proposed or what will be proposed in 2024. So a brief overview of what we've done this past year. Uh, we've added some relief to our Route 1. Uh, it's a route that is very busy and at times has issues staying on time. So we put a few things into place to uh, keep the route on time. We added an additional block during peak hours. So again, this allows for the uh, route to stay on time and keep on time. And we also reduced frequencies on Saturdays to 20 minutes. So. Uh, we were finding that uh, the route really wasn't able to keep time on Saturdays, especially without that help from the, the seventh block. And so uh, this was really a something that came as a suggestion from some of our drivers. We looked at it and figured that it actually does work pretty well. And the key thing is we haven't seen a big drop off in ridership by reducing frequency by five minutes. Um, the Route 64 extension, so this was meant to go into place in August of uh, this year, but it has since been delayed. The big thing that was driving this change was the opening of the Amazon uh, distribution centers in East Pasco. Uh, that project has continued to be delayed, so we are tentatively um, planning that implementation for March of this coming year. So. We'll continue to stay in contact with Amazon. And if anything changes there, we may delay that implementation further. So uh, we also uh, eliminated Route 66 and increased frequencies uh, on Route 67 to every 30 minutes and extended Route 67 down the road 100 in Chapel Hill. And then something else that uh, we put into place this year was eliminating Route uh, 110 service from the mall. So this wasn't necessarily something we wanted to do, but it was really something that need, needed to be done based on our vehicle fleet. Um, this route requires, or the, the movement through the mall requires 30 foot buses. And at the moment, I think we only have eight of them and we, we had 11 prior and that allowed us to keep the 110 in there. And so, uh, yeah, that's a little bit of a background with what we've done this past year. So kind of an overall view of what we've been doing, uh, the, the long-term goal and, and some changes we've made in the past uh, five, five to six years to move towards that long-term goal. Uh, we had the comprehensive service plan in 2017. This laid out uh, quite a bit of uh, recommendations that we put into place. And really what came of that was extension, a lot of route changes, but extension of service hours to eventually 10 p.m. Initially it was 8 p.m. Uh, and then- Some of are. Yeah, exactly, yeah, just to 8 p.m. So um, also our frequent service corridor. So this was implemented in June of 2021. Uh, the main route here, or the main routes, I should say are route one and route three. So this is a service corridor of routes that operate every 15 minutes or better. Uh, so we'd eventually like to also implement more routes that operate at 15 minute service. Uh, we have a tentative plan to implement a route two, which would basically be providing service between Richland and Kennewick, or excuse me, Richland and Pasco, um, kind of what the 268, 225 does now but it would be one route alignment that would be every 15 minutes. So really what we're waiting for there is uh, our West Pasco transit hub to make that a uh, possibility. So we're hoping that will be online sometime 2025, but uh, we're really just waiting and seeing when the best time to implement that route two would be. So you guys have uh, can we ask questions? Of, of oh yeah, yeah. Okay. If it's a small group, I have no no problem doing okay. that. Yeah. So I, because I've heard about this Route Two and Route Four, yeah, or Metro routes. Yeah, do they have a map a route planned out for those yet? Or? Uh so it's it's a concept at this point. Like we know the main commercial areas, the, the main you know dense residential areas that we need to serve. So we have a general idea. Okay. Um, I get into that a little bit more in, in, further okay. on in this presentation. 
So we've also expanded service on Sundays. Uh, so I believe that was in 2021, about a little over a year ago, we added Sunday service to, Jibber. yeah, just, a, yeah, exactly. Only a few of our fixed routes. And uh, it's really just a base network that we rely on our on-demand service connect to kind of fill in the gaps. And uh, we're actually suggesting some changes to that service. So I'll get into that in a little bit. And then one of the big things we have uh, coming down the line here is our transit hub. So we have a Queensgate, downtown Pasco and West Pasco uh, transit hubs planned and funded. So this is funded by 80% um, state uh, grants and then the other 20% will be local. So the Queensgate uh, project is probably the most far along. We've actually put that out to bid and uh, construction will start here in about uh, one to two months. So yeah, I heard the Queensgate one that the 170 will not, it, it'll it be using that one. And uh, I heard that like, it'll go into Bit City, but it's not go in. Yeah, the, it'll so look like it's around out in the out towards Prosser. Yeah, so the plan is to have uh, basically a circulator route within Bent City. Yeah. And that may eventually be extended along uh, Highway 224 to West Richland. But then we would also have the 170 that would connect with it somewhere within Benton City, okay. but it wouldn't act as that circulator. Like yeah, because they're talking about putting the 20 out there. Yeah, extending it. Yeah, it's a lot of that is still up in the air, not being proposed for this next year. But uh, we've had a pretty extensive outreach uh, out in Crosser and Benton City, and and that's basically what we've been hearing that there needs to be a local circulator route in both of those towns. Yeah, except for the 20 being expanded, I heard of Bit City having its own route. Yeah. And, and so, really, next year will be when we start to get those recommendations solidified because uh, I want a little bit more public outreach and working with our operators to figure out what's best. But uh, so, yeah, the downtown Pasco, we have property uh, for this project and we're going to start design work here in about a month. Uh, and then West Pasco is a little bit more up in the air. Our idea is to get this uh, transit hub to be near a lot of the commercial development that's going on or that will be going on in the Broadmoor area. If you've heard about the, the yeah, exactly. If you've heard about the Costco that's going in or is planned to go in, um, we're trying to kind of feed off of that and that development. So as well. that area then. Yeah. I was wondering about that. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, uh, we are still looking for land out there. And as you can expect, it's pretty uh, spendy because it's, you know, prime commercial real estate. And so, and it's Pasco. yeah, and it's Pasco. So our plan really is to try and get somewhere that's kind of in between the commercial, closer to the residential as well, and try and, you know, facilitate something that um, is walkable for, for all those uses. But unfortunately, I think a lot of it's just going to end up being kind of that spread out development that isn't conducive to transit, but our plans to get ahead of it and try and encourage some of that type of development. Uh, and then future express service, I think I was kind of talking to you about this, uh, Tyson. Uh, so really, I think we need to look into a network of routes that connect direct, directly to all these areas and bypass, uh, you know, some of the that basically we just want to improve travel time between the long distances that people have to travel with the Tri-Cities. So this is really just a high level concept right now, but we know as an agency, we need to move towards or at least provide those service types. So here's a glimpse of the future you had kind of, you had asked about, you know, what do the routes look like? This is by no means a set in stone. But any of the green routes up there, you can see the one, the two, the three, even the four. And uh, the four would that basically be a connection to Southridge, the Three Rivers, and then along like Keene and that whole area. Again, not even close to set in stone, but this is kind of a concept of, of what we want to work towards. Yeah, because I heard they were talking about expanding the three from Dayton out to Southridge. Like, why? Yeah, that. That that will be an eventual plan, um, but we'll see if it ends up that way. I think we need to do a lot more work in, in terms of figuring out travel patterns before we make those type of investments and commitments.
sense, but. Yeah, because you'd have to be going from Dayton to Pasco to Southridge and like all over the place. Yeah, yeah. But I think really, you know, our goal is to just get 15 minute service between these these hubs, so, so to speak. And that's that's the main goal here. And then any of the blue routes, that's just your typical or your your existing and somewhat altered uh, local system. And then um, this actually isn't in the works anymore, but we want to do something like that. Any of the red routes you see are kind of a smaller micro mini bus system that would be electric. We were going out for grant funding, but didn't receive it. So that's kind of just going to be on the back burner for now. I know one thing I suggested to a couple of people is having like a direct bus from uh, Ridgeland down to Dayton. Dayton, yep. That's that out of the express would be our, our first priority. So how's it going? Are you here for the BFT meeting? Yeah, yeah. So it um we're, we're just getting into it. So you didn't miss too much so far, but if there's anything uh you know you, you want to see, I, I can go through the presentation as well. So I can just kind of sign up. Yeah, because I know like there's times where I might need to catch a bus at Dayton and I'm coming from Richland, it's like I have to transfer another bus just to get to another bus. So yeah. Like a direct route, you know. Yeah. Like one of those expresses. Yeah. Um, okay, so the annual service plan approach. So we started the annual service plan process two years ago because um, we just saw a need to have a formalized process to where we get information from you know internal, external, and and you know the data. What we're seeing is actually happening out on the road. Kind of combining all that um, and creating service recommendations all within an annual process to where the board approves it. Uh, we work with training, with finance, uh, with ops to determine what are the resource needs, and then getting that approved a good, you know, six, seven months prior to the changes. In the past, it kind of been, you know, we had done the process differently. Sometimes we would come up with the change and implement it, you know, only three or four months after the fact, after it was approved. And we just wanted a little bit more lead time. And um, you know, just a, a solidified process to where uh, you know everyone's involved. So, so this is just an example internal feedback. Uh, we had a online and physical, um, basically feedback form that we made available to all the drivers and anyone at BFT, and this played into uh, some of the recommendations that we're making for 2023. Uh, so operator input, uh, the, the big main areas of concern were changes in service, uh, requests for feedback. Uh, you can see that Dayton Night Street Express uh, down there in the left-hand column. Uh, that's something oh, okay. that's came up as well. Oh, so another little one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's something that's been talked about. Um, in terms of, you know, route-specific issues, the one came up a lot, uh, issues with timing on that. Um, route 47, so this was mostly related to- And I use the one a lot too, is I've noticed that there's times where you don't even know if you're gonna make it in time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, route one, route 47 on Sunday, uh, that was a big request from operators you can see, but we saw that uh, coming in as well during our survey process for the public. Um, Route 48, uh, a lot of what we heard here was, you know, it needs to be consistent on Saturday. It, it drops down to hourly on Saturday, and it's the only local route that does that for whatever reason uh, on Saturdays, other than the ones that are already hourly, if that makes right. sense. Um, which, I didn't know the 48 was hourly on Saturday. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we're going to be improving that. Uh, route 268. So this only came as one comment from the operators, but we heard it a lot from um, the customers when we took away that Route 66 in Pasco. It left a pretty big gap on Saturdays. So we've been hearing that quite a bit. And so we're trying to address that with adding that 268 on Saturdays. Uh, transit centers. So this was really um, uh, connections that aren't being made and mostly with the Route 1 at Three Rivers and also at Night Street in 22nd. So 
if anything gets if that route gets late those connections are hard to make sometimes and then there's also just um, the fact that the route one is every 15 minutes and most of the other routes are every 30 minutes so just by you know having different frequencies some of those trips that are off poles so to speak aren't going to connect with anything so that's just the nature of having it more frequent and i know from my experience on using the one it seems like it's there's no wait time at three rivers yeah you have plenty of nice trees if they have pasco oh yeah it's like you pull in and you go and it's like what the heck yeah and then pasco nights are you're sitting there for who knows how long yeah I know that nice tree, there's one year and then another one pulls in, now it pulls out, another one comes in. It's like, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's that seventh block that gives a lot of, that's what that is. yeah, that give, gives a lot of weight or a lot of layover recovery time um, for those those buses. I know a lot of drivers like it because it's overtime on it, but it's just as yeah. a crowd itself, don't really, a lot of people don't care for it. Yeah. Um, so some acknowledged successes, uh, improvements on routes, Sunday service, and uh, the youth pass. That's been, um, you know, both the public and internally, we've we've really saw that 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 program's really taken off and been quite an improvement. Is it going to keep going? Ever? Yeah. So it's solidified now. It's it's um, you know until the board decides to take it away, which I don't think they would because it opens up a lot of funding to us. And basically the revenue we would take in from selling is far less than, you know, the 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 grant revenue we get um, from the state. So and plus I just say the passengers on money too. So yeah. To go out and buy tickets or a bus pass for the kids. Yeah, exactly. So especially me. The only thing we're running into is it is, you know, people that are over 18 are trying to use it in some instances. So we we just, you know, that's more enforcement on our part, but so in April, we went through a pretty extensive uh, survey process where we were at all the transit centers, riding routes, trying to get feedback from the customers. Um, the big input we got here was, you know, the Route 1 connections. We had talked about that. Uh, Route 47 on Sundays, Route 268 on Saturdays. Uh, we've gotten a lot of requests to improve service in Bed City and Prosser. Uh, as well as add one seven to Sunday service, which we aren't actually doing this time around, but it's something that's been requested. Um, I think from our perspective, yeah, that's needed uh, as kind of a lifeline service, but it's really not going to be that productive over route because it's just not productive in the weekdays or Saturdays either. So right. I think there's other things on Sundays that we need to address before uh, Prosser events. Uh, we also uh, were told that we need earlier service on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, later hours on Sundays, as well as service to Amazon and King City and Pasco. So we're directing the one later hours on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. And the earlier start time on Sundays too. Yeah. So that is something we're not proposing, but right. it's on our radar. So I know a lot of people with work or church or you know whatever. The best will start to like, hey, your your church starts at like eight thirty. Yeah. Exactly. So um, on time, some data observations we made. So, uh, you know, in the planning department, we try to look as much data as possible. Are the buses running on time? Where are people getting on and off? What are loads like? Are the buses super full? And then we also use, you know, input from drivers, input from the customers to, to figure out what's actually going on. And of course, go out and ride the routes as well. So some of the things we've been seeing, route, route one is pretty late on weekdays, um, but also, you know, when, when we originally looked at this route one and three, we're running hot on Sundays, but we're seeing now that route one's actually getting, as ridership grows, it's getting bogged down uh, at certain points and actually running late quite a bit. So um, route three tripper from Pasco High School in the PM rush. So that route three gets basically packed for, only about five to 10 minutes along Court Street, but it's an issue we need to address and it sounds like it's getting worse. So um, this is something, you know, one of those, um, it's really a good problem to have, but we just wanna make sure the customer experience is, is still um, on par with what we wanna provide because, you know, if you're packed in, in a bus for, for more than a minute or two, it's not the best experience, so. 
Um, so the Route 65 runs uh, hot during off-peak hours, Route 123 late on Sundays. And by hot, I mean it's running over the schedule. So uh, sorry, I didn't explain that prior, but it means basically if it if we say a bus is going to be here at, you know, let's say 11 a.m. and the bus shows up and passes at 11 or 1058, then that would be considered hot. I remember when back in the day, they used to be like the two to five minute holes and then they took those away. I'm like, why? Yeah. Now would be the perfect time to have it. Agreed. So that's that's a good comment to bring back from this, if anything. So, um, so low ridership, we've uh, seen low ridership on Route 41, 110, 170. Uh, that's no coincidence. Those are our routes that are either an hour or less frequency. So we've really, you know, made a commitment. Yeah, yeah, that as well. So, um, and really when we're looking at ridership, we look at boardings per revenue hour. So service span doesn't necessarily impact that, but um, yeah, these routes, you know, you can't really rely on a, a service that comes every hour. So we wanna try and get away from those, those type of routes in the future. Uh, we also, um, Notice that there was kind of a steep drop off in ridership after 8 p.m. And then uh, we, we saw that, especially with Route 1, 3, and 48, at least proportional to the ridership it normally gets. Um, with the 1 and 3, we are addressing that uh, with our recommendations. So I know earlier I, I touched on, you know, we track where people are getting on and off. We try to try to figure out travel patterns with people so we can better make better decisions. And this is kind of just an example of the data we look at. Um, you can think of this as kind of a heat map of where our ridership is. Obviously downtown Pasco, East Pasco, um, Clearwater, we're seeing a lot of ridership there. Um, Richland proper and even parts of West Richland. Um, we, we see a lot of ridership, but this just allows us to have a good sense of, you know, where is, are these routes actually being used? Where are there some areas that we could potentially route or reroute routes to, to be more efficient or potentially take routes away altogether? And, you know, in some instances, where do we need more service? So. Uh, addressing growth. So a big part of what uh, we do as a planning department is keep tabs on development for all the cities and try and gauge that and couple it with plans for new service to expand to these areas. Mm -hmm. The problem with the Tri-Cities, as you can see, all these areas where uh, we're seeing a lot of growth um, are on the peripheries, they're on the, on the boundaries. So that makes it hard for us as a transit agency to get good services out there. The recommendations we're making today uh, or, or through this plan really don't address most of what's going on in these areas. Um, I can say area five to the right here to the east um, in East Pasco and King City, we are extending that Route 64 and that will, will improve service out to this area, but um, We'd eventually like to try and get some sort of service out to King City. Uh, the number three area, the, the West Pasco area, that's where we're trying to put that West Pasco transit hub. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully that would, you know, uh, allow us to uh, provide better service in uh, West Pasco and just Pasco as a whole. Um, this number four area, the Southridge area. So I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but we do have local funds to build a transit center there, but it's going to be more of a smaller scale enhanced stop with a park and ride feature. And so that'll come probably later in 2026, 2027. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, the um, number one area over there, the, the route, uh, state route 224 corridor um, in West Richland, we uh, West Richland's really concentrating their growth in this area. It's going to be a big commercial area in the future, and we've worked with them to to put infrastructure in so we can have a fixed route extended out there at some point. So that's that later. Surprises me. Yeah, that that's later down the road, but 
yeah, we as the yeah. planning department, we we need to be on top of these and be thinking about you know five ten years in the future. So, so here are the service recommendations. Really, uh, you know what we're here for today. Um, so route one, we're going to be reducing to thirty minute frequencies after eight p.m. on weekdays and Saturdays. Um, this this along with route three was really based on observations we saw where ridership dropped off. And we've been pressured by our board to be more efficient. And this is somewhere where we saw, hey, we can see um, better efficiencies here. The ridership levels we were seeing between 8 and 10 p.m. didn't really warrant 15 minute service. So, uh, no, I mean, no, no, I'd say, you know, the winter, obviously, we see a little bit more of a drop off, but that's ridership as a whole, but especially at night. And so it's not necessarily all seasons, um, but even in the seasons where we see higher ridership, it's not like it's to the level that, again, um, would would um, basically warrant that that frequent service. and. And so a big thing we've been hearing is these empty buses driving around, which, you know, we as the planning department, we don't necessarily agree with, you know, some of those uh, comments that are being said, but we do realize a lot of those issues and comments stem from, you know, our, our buses running around at night and being empty. And, and this is something to where we think, you know, yes, we'd like 15 minute service between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., but 30 minute service will suffice. Yeah, because sometimes there are empty buses because people can't count on it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then yeah. they find other ways to travel. Yeah, it's a, it's a chicken, <laughs> chicken and the egg. And, and it's, yeah, and what's unfortunate is that whole um, conversation and perception really gained, gained uh, picked up some steam during COVID when people weren't people riding were yeah, and September, this past September, we finally reached pre-COVID ridership levels on the bus. And so we're finally starting to see that recovery. Um, and so, yeah, it's just unfortunate that that conversation came along um, when, when we were in COVID, because that was the biggest deterrent of ridership, really, or people riding the bus, I should say. So. Yeah, I was one of the ones that stepped away during COVID. Yeah. Uh, so route one, we're also going to um, basically solidify that 20 minute frequency on Saturdays. It's all but solidified. It's more just say, telling the board, hey, this is permanent. Um, uh, we're also going to have an alignment adjustment. So I will get into this, uh, the, the particulars of this after, but uh, basically the um, alignment around Quinault, Okanagan and, and Columbia Center Boulevard. We're doing just minor changes there to speed the route up. Uh, so we already have a hold at Three Rivers Tr Transit or TC, but uh, we're going to look more into, you know, what do uh, the holds look like at the transit centers? Um, like you said, they, they, they mentioned they don't do holds anymore. And see, I've heard something different. So we just need to standardize that as an agency. And that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on. Um, route three, we're doing the same thing as we're doing along route one, reducing it to 30 minute frequencies after 8 p.m. on weekdays and Saturdays. Route 40, we're adding Sunday service and scheduling that on pulse. That route uh, at the moment leaves off pulse, meaning it doesn't connect with all the other routes um, uh, that are on pulse. I know that gets a little bit confusing. So but instead of doing 15, 45, we top and 30. Yep. yep. Um, Route 42, we're removing Sunday service. So what we found in looking into ridership um, patterns is that 42 is mostly used as just the means between um, Three Rivers and Dayton. And so the 40 will still provide that, that, but what the 40 will do, there's two benefits. It'll provide a better connection between Dayton and Clearwater um, on Sundays. And then it'll also be able to pick up some of that load along clear water so the, the Route 1 isn't so bogged down. And uh, I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. So you're expanding service on the 40 on clear water? Just on no, it, so it's only that still that oh, small still that segment. Small yeah. yeah. 
So really it's that Winco stock that it'll be serving as well, or for the most part, so. Um, so Route 48, we're adding 30 minute service on uh, Saturdays, and this will only be till 8 p.m. Then it drops off to 60 minute service. Um, Route 268, we're adding Saturday service. Um, this goes back to you know the elimination of the 66 and uh, that service not being uh, that area of Chapel Hill and Road 100 not having direct fix route service on Saturdays. So we're just going to be adding that 268 on Saturdays. And then what it also does is provide a trip every 15 minutes between Richland and Pasco from 22nd to 9th on Saturdays, which at the moment you don't have that. So yeah, um, when they took out that 66, there was a lot of uproar on that. Yeah. Um, the Hanford Express service, uh, this is something that we're working with our board of directors and Hanford on, um, basically, like Hanford area, right? yeah, the Hanford area. So, um, yeah, that type is crazy. yeah, and I should probably, you're right. I should probably say that explicitly that this is separate from the, the service we have for Hanford high, but, um, yeah, we're trying to just provide some sort of commuter service to the Hanford area. There's a lot of barriers that we have, both literal and uh, and um, just other barriers we need to get through to make the service happen. But we're going to start a survey process and then have a potential pilot project go into place next year. So if there was a shuttle service, for Hanford would be like at every transit center or how would that work? Uh, so we're thinking one per one, basically three routes right now, one from Pasco, one from Kennewick, one from Riverstone. Okay. So, yeah, because I live over in that area. So I'm, there's been quite a few times I've caught up in that traffic. Like, uh... Yeah. <laughs> Thing is, we're not going to make a huge impact initially, but if, if, if it becomes something that, you know, most of the people use transit to get out there, then it could, but yeah. Yeah, trains. Yeah. So Queensgate integration, this is uh, the, these are the 2024 changes that I had mentioned earlier. So our Queensgate Transit Hub is going to come online in um, tentatively uh, June of 2024. And so what we want to do is extend Route 26 so it serves the Queensgate uh, Transit Hub. Um, we would probably do something different with that routing through uh, the South Jadwin area that's currently served by 123. We could all, we'd also potentially adjust the frequencies there. It runs at every 20 minutes, but we could potentially run it at every 30 minutes again uh, if it works out better with uh, the resource allocation. So the, the Jadwin neighborhood, what, what section? So that's that's South Jadwin. So that's like from um, Gothels to uh, I think Adams. Also oh, the other the other the way of the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. South. Yeah. Um, so Route One Ten, uh, we're going to eliminate the route. A lot of those sections between Queensgate and the Three Rivers area aren't productive whatsoever. So we want to just kind of reallocate those. West. Yeah, Hills West <laughs> is the big one. Um, we want to reallocate those resources and try and find, you know, a better way of serving West Richland. They only have one hour service. No one really uses it. Um, and so we want to try and figure out how, how to serve that area better. And really all those routes will originate out of the new Queensgate um, Transit Center. Uh, 123, uh, realign to serve Wellesian Way and potentially Dupertail like the like what we had talked about earlier today. Um, we would also route through uh, the Queensgate TC or the tra transit hub. Um, and so really the idea with the 123 would be that it would just stop there, kind of how the route one does now, more to just provide quick service. So but, it would still make it, to, it, would still the, it would still go to three rivers. Yeah, and it's, it's somewhat up in the air, but what I don't want to do is make that trip from Queensgate to Three Rivers or Queensgate to Knight Street longer. So, you know, I don't want to try and add another break point, point here. So right. we're going to have to do this in a way that's, um, you know, we, we're, we're still working on it. Yeah, because I have in my mind when I hear about all these 
new trend of places going up, like so they're be re allowing re more routes or you know adding routes or you know how, yeah. how are they going to do that? Yeah, it's adding routes, but also extending and and kind of shifting uh, resources routes. So. Yeah, because I'm the type where when there's a new route or there's a minor change on any route, I have to ride the route from beginning to end to just mm -hmm. to see where it is because I was like trying to put it in my head like uh, okay, that's where and then yeah, you actually go do it yourself. And it's like wow. Yeah, it's definitely different. Yeah, and so uh, the 170 really that'll break, which is our route that serves Prosser and Benton City. That'll um, originate from this new transit center, and it won't go all the way in the Ninth Street. So something we found in our um, public outreach process was that a lot of people coming from Prosser and Benton City, the majority wanted to get to the Queensgate area, and either that or um, the Columbia Center area. And so we just figured, you know, it's going to be this is going to make things easier for them. Uh, yeah, they'll still need to transfer, but they could get on something that gets them to where they need to be a lot quicker. So um, we're also going to potentially add Sunday service on that 170. I, I can't say, again, none of this is we're really committed to. Um, this will be part of that 2024 annual service plan process. So a year from now, we'll be having uh, probably a little bit more extensive of outreach um, even prior to that to, to solidify these changes. Um, so new routes, uh, I think I talked about the West Richland route. I, I wanna try and get 30 minute service out to West Richland and have a local route. Um, route 70 would be a potential um, internal route in Benton City, local route for oh, Benton City. Route, that's route 20. And then the express route. So I've mentioned this a few times in this um, presentation, but we just need routes that hit the the kind of nodes of all of our network and, and provide better travel time. So again, none of this is set in stone, but it's just something we want to work towards and, and solidify next year. So this is what that service would kind of look like. Um, the, the purple route, if you can see it, I know it's probably hard to see. That's the 170 red route on your left would be that internal circulator. The blue route um, in kind of the middle here would be uh, that local um, West Richland route. And then you can see kind of a few of the changes we've made by extending the route 26 down to um, the Queensgate Transit Center. So. The location of that is going to be right here. It's by like Tagaris, Book Walter, that whole area, the Tulip Lane Park and Ride. And so, yeah, that's uh, construction on that's going to start soon. But that process is a good 14 to 16 months long. So, it's going to be a good two years before we get service there. So, yeah, because I guess the 26 way has now been happening. They go the other way to go. It's like, wow. Yeah. And it may not again. This is this is kind of just the preliminary right. um, ideas, but I think we need to um, put a lot more work into it. Some other operational changes we're recommending: um, we're going to update our connect zones and connection points, as well as the service parameters. Um, I know I mentioned it earlier, but at Hanford Plus Energy Northwest feasibility study. So, what is it we want to do in terms of service out to these areas? Um, we're going to address our seasonal service policy and potential new special event service. So we really don't have a good way of fielding requests for um, special event service. And so we want to establish a good policy for that. Um, you know what's really nice? <laughs> uh, I'm just saying if you're going to make it, if you're going to make policies, continue to make it accessible. Sometimes when people are like, oh, we're going to figure out how to do this and this. Sometimes it just makes it difficult. Yeah. Rather than like, sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. No, <laughs> and, and but we really appreciated being able to ask, hey, we're having this event. Can yeah. you guys make it possible to get to the park? Yeah. And then it happens. Yeah. You know, um, um sometimes when when you create a process, it makes it difficult to make that. Yeah, but and I, I think the only issue we've ran into is 
you know, some events we obviously want to provide service for, but we just don't have the buses or really the resources at that time. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we basically need to build that in. And because there's been times where, you know, um, the upper management or someone somewhere within our organization is committed to providing service. Mm -hmm. And then we have to scramble to get that those that's resources perfect. together. So yeah. It's more that we just want more lead time for these things. Mm -hmm. And I agree, bureaucracy isn't always the answer, but um, the fact we just have no real way of actually fielding these requests, we need to at least add something that's formalized. So yeah, yeah. so we, again, so we can um, manage our resources and commit our resources in a way that, you know, doesn't affect our other services. On the event service thing, another thing I see that I, I feel needs to be done is like during the fair, there should be a shuttle service over in the Three Rivers area. Because mm -hmm. you only got downtown Kennewick. Well, but if you can't drive ever, you know, mm -hmm. the buses aren't running, you want to stay till late. Well, you have no way, you know, you have no way home to get down to that area because there's no bus. Yeah. So I add like I add a, a fair express run during the fair week. Yeah. From Three Rivers area down to the fairgrounds. Yeah. No, that's a great idea, but it kind of gets back to our resources. And we're in a tight spot right now for several different reasons. But right. um, like the fair, I know, for example, we were stretched pretty thin this year, but great idea. And, it's and good to be back, though. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Fortunately, I wasn't able to use it this year. Um, so we're also going to reassess tripper and overload service during our uh, service area schools. Uh, that serve our, our service area schools. So a good example of this would be like the loads we see along the 47 uh, along Union here with Southridge. Um, is that something that we could need to potentially add buses to at like one or two trips a day? So everyone's not packed in and we're not leaving people at bus stops. So um, also, you know, the, the the example I brought up about Pasco High along court, that's another example we just need to figure out, um, you know, how we can better serve those and, and how we can potentially um, avoid those situations where people are crammed into buses. So I have a question on the discontinued tri the general demand. Yeah. What is the general demand? Okay, so yeah, I skipped over that, which is a huge one. So general demand is basically dial a ride but for people who aren't ada eligible but we designate points that you can go to and from okay so it's a service from a dollar area yeah so where it's mostly used is in finley right now because there's no fixed route right but we also have connect that goes out there and i think you know what we're trying to do is just get away from the general demand in the Tri-Cities altogether because there's only a handful of people using it. And it's a really costly service. And um, Connect can really provide very similar service. Not only that, it could be same day. So um, with so general demand- I will be used in Finley coming into like date or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I know there are people here that, um, like my ex, she has epilepsy. And unless she's with somebody, she can't ride the bus. So yeah, the way that she can is to get around is through dollar ride. Yeah, um, but that she is she's probably ADA eligible for that. Um, so this wouldn't be yeah, this wouldn't be the ADA dollar ride. She oh, okay. still yeah. So this again, just general She'd demand. Okay she yeah okay. yeah yeah. Is she in Finley? No, she's off uh, off Vancouver. Okay, yeah. Or by Cross Seven Hills. Yeah, so I, I I would bet that she's ADA eligible, conditional eligibility based on her epilepsy, and okay. and it shouldn't impact her. But um, and any change that she gets, uh, her mom, her stepmom actually works for her, drives Dollar Right. Yeah, so she probably gets word from her too. Yeah, anything that happens. Yeah, this 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 continuation of general demand is really. I'm not saying it won't impact anyone. There there will be a few people that are impacted. But it's it's very small in comparison to some of these other changes, and it's something again we're just trying to get away of, away from because we have other services that provide similar some similar um, transportation options. Um, so we're, we'll also be looking at routine schedule adjustments to improve on time performance. So uh, we're constantly looking at on time performance, seeing which routes are um, behind and trying to figure out, you know, is that a scheduling issue, an anomaly, 
Is it ridership? Are we getting a lot more people riding the bus so it slows down, which has actually been happening recently? Um, and that bus have GPS on them. It's easier to kind of keep track of yeah, where exactly. they're at and if they're behind. Or exactly. And we can pull up a report and look at all that. And so um, we'll just be making routine schedule adjustments come next uh, June. And then we'll also be removing or posting all flag stops. So flag stops are stops with no, no post or sign. There's about 50 of them out in our service area or our fixed route network now. Um, as of a couple of years ago, there was a little over 100. So we've slowly been trying to remove those. Um, they're just an issue because, you know, only a few people know about them. If a new driver is driving the route, yes, it's on their Ranger, but the visual cue isn't there. And so it just causes issues. So, so it was like, be like, like, but it'd be, it'd be like a sign just think flag stop or something. Well, no, it would just be a normal sign like oh, okay. or a bus stop sign. Okay. So, yeah, the idea is, you know, any of the ones that are actually used consistently will post. So, Because I know a lot of the major flag stops that were being used a lot were actually turned into an actual stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, we're going to continue that process. Of the 50 left, a very small percentage are still being used. And then any of them that just aren't used, we'll just get rid of. But, yeah, because I know there'll be, I think it was 123 hours on it one day and said flag stop. I'm like, what? Like, what? Yeah. Still doing those? Yeah. We're we're trying to get rid of them, but what we want don't want to do is just remove them all together and leave people high and dry right. without going through a good process. Yeah, and I know a lot of the places it may not be may or may not be a flag stop. It's just kind of like driver discretion if they're okay with dropping you off, you know, somewhere closer to where you like the stops over here and you need to go over there and it's like a dead area. It's like, oh well, no one's stop you off at the stop or yeah, it's fine, like let you off in the corner or something. Yeah, that's so they're supposed to be doing reason, reasonable um, uh, modifications to, to service. So if it's within, you know, a certain amount of feet, then they're allowed to do that. But yeah. I know they go a little bit beyond that. The ones I ride with usually do. Yeah, yeah. It I really. Mean, there's been a few others. It's like, hey, can you look up in the corner or whatever? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, removing all those and new bus stop signage. So we've been working on some new bus yeah, stop new signage. Bus stop we have a design and um, basically we're waiting to get to solidify our plans for the future to start distributing all those. We're gonna plan on putting those along our route one um, first and then and then we'll expand from there. So I'm hoping we can address this next year, at least start that process, so. Would it be the same color? No, they look quite a bit different. So yeah, noticeable, notice, yeah. <laughs> And ADA compliant. I yeah. remember the, I remember the blue with the old brown ones. Oh. So I'm gonna speed this up here. We only have about um, six or seven minutes, but with Connect, I don't know, does anyone write Connect here? No. Okay, so what we're doing here, I, I briefly touched on it earlier, but we're updating some of the connection points, um, zones, the goal here is to reduce bypass of the fixed route service and reduce conflict with BFT buses. Uh, we've heard a lot from our own drivers that um, there's a perception and to some degree a reality of people completely bypassing our fixed route system and using connect. And really the idea is if a trip can be made with the bus, you should be making the trip with the bus rather than getting a point to point. Um, service, which is, you know, connect in some, in some ways it is kind of like a taxi and how we've set it up has kind of, or encouraged that type of use. And we're just trying to change some things to make it um, uh, not be that way. Really, Yeah. So. It's like where I live now, there was no bus service on Sunday. Yeah. So that would be a good thing for the connect to use. And, and that's, that's, it. yeah, that's the purpose of connect is to, to provide you know, where there's low demand, but people still may need the trip, it's to provide that connection to the fixed route. And people have just learned to use it in ways that kind of bypass it all together. So yeah. we, we as agency need to identify, you know, how do we actually, um, again, discourage that bypass. Yeah, I've never bypass. used the one twenty three on Sunday, but I passed it one time coming down Stevens, coming down Catskill to uh, Jadwin, I'm over on the other side. Yeah, so six doesn't run either. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is a map of ridership on Connect, and you can kind of see that those areas kind of away from uh, like Finley, for example, Southridge, 
Um, you know, we're getting ridership into there. Uh, the Costco processing, the hall area right here, the like research and all that. Yeah. And so, you know, that those are the types of situations where we want the service to work and what they should, it should be used for. Um, but yeah, so we'll go on a little. This is just displaying the, the increase of ridership along Connect. We're doing about 500 rides a day. Oh, wow. So the service is working, but again, we're trying to, any trips that could be made along the fixed route, we're trying to encourage people to do that other than, you know, use these resources up, so. So timeline um, for this ASP or the 2023 annual service plan recommendations. Um, so we released the actual document October 17th. It could be found on our website. Um, we're holding our 30 day public comment period, which really extends beyond that 30 days because we really won't end it until the public hearing on December 8th, um, which will be part of our regular board meeting which at this point, I know the information says it's going to be at our MOA, but it's looking like it's actually going to be at the Benton County Courthouse because we're, we're, we're in a process of, <laughs> we're in a process of moving uh, our ops, everything out of our ops building so we could tear it down and build a new one. And we're going to have to use the boardroom for office space. So um, just keep up to date if you do plan on going to that public hearing a few days beforehand, just confirm where it's at. You uh, can post it on Facebook or your website. Yeah, it'll be somewhere. it'll be posted on on a Facebook. Okay, yeah, because I check the website regularly for any like detours or yeah stuff like that. So yeah, um, so yeah, we'll approve it in December, like I said, and then implement in 2023. So we'll implement some of the delay 2022 service changes, like the Route 64, in in hopefully March. Again, that may be um, that may be delayed further, and then basically everything I've said here or recommended here will be put in place in June. Why June? Not sooner. Not sooner. So June is is kind of the time of the year that we feel best is for major service changes, and there's a few reasons for that. But the main reason is that's when school gets out, and then this gives us a way of changing the service. Um, right prior to summer so people can learn that service and the changes prior to fall and, and when people are going to need it for school. Okay. So that's that's one reason. There's a few more, but I think um, really we're trying to move towards just having it, all these changes once a year, and June just seems seem like the best time. Yeah, because I've noticed it's been like June or September, unless there are minor changes. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. Whenever. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the plan is June. Um, and really, that's it. I think if there's any questions, I appreciate everyone being here today. I think we got some good input. Um, but yeah, I'd say just, you know, spread the word if you can. And if you have any further comment, just either send it to customer service or if you think it's something that you need to get in front of the board and let them know about before they approve this. Um, then I encourage you to come to the public hearing, which again, it's kind of, it's tentative where that'll be, but uh, just make sure to um, either call customer service or look on social media uh, prior, a few days prior to figure that out. So. Okay. Anything else or any questions, comments? Is this available online? Uh, the presentation, it is not, but uh, we'll make sure to get a link or I could send it to you directly. Um, but I, I can get the link and, and, and we can get it set up online. So. Yeah, because I was going to ask for a copy of when you, when, you, when you did that one about the, the slide about the where all the metro routes would go or whatever. Yeah. I was wanting a copy of that part. The, yeah, and, and we can put that out there. I just, I, I want to be clear that that's not set in stone at right. all. Like that may scare some people if they see it. And um, it's it's really just a vision and a concept rather than, a solidified uh, service change. Yep. And, and I think um, I think this is a good high level overview. But our uh, annual service plan, which is online on our website, yeah, completely designed to back with the So yeah. I think I would recommend for you to go to that one if you have any questions at all. Yeah. And I can send you a link if you can email. Yeah. So with that plan, is there um, to do feedback with it? 
Um, yeah, uh, how you would do that is, and these are things we're trying to improve upon. Ideally, I'd like just, you know, a, a comment box and you type in, but um, submit your comments to customer service that way. So, yeah, the typical, yeah. And just be clear that it's, you know, for the annual service plan. Okay. I remember when they had the um, the board up in the the lobby over at Three Rivers. Um, I know there was some on there that I agreed with that weren't mentioned is like lights at the at stops and where there's no light.